Hey, it's Mike Hamber at Flipner.com. Welcome back for another exciting VIP interview where I interview successful real estate investing experts and other entrepreneurs in our industry to help you learn and grow. Today, I'm joined by Nathan Jurowitz. Nathan has a lot of experience with real estate investing, but he's not actually a real estate investor anymore. But what he discovered during the time is his calling to teach other people how to be successful with networking, which is the core skill to be successful as a real estate investor. Today is going to be an awesome show. Uh, Nathan is going to share some tips on networking, which again is something that will clearly differentiate you from success or not. Before we get started though, let's take a moment to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of Flipner.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, Nathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, yeah, glad, glad you're here. here. Glad you're yeah. here. So uh, we've had a lot of common friends, although this is the first time we've ever met before. And uh, I know you have uh, an experience that you, uh, a lot of experience in real estate investing in the past. And it's interesting because a lot of the guests that I have on the show are, are still active real estate investors in one way or another. Um, and you're a little bit different in the fact that you left the industry. Why don't you maybe tell us a little bit about that and then tell us a little bit more about you as well. Just want to get it out there because I know a lot of people know you from the real estate investing space. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I don't, it's not really a, a hugely exciting story, but you know, I, <laughs> you could I kind of ad, ad lib and make some exciting words. Yeah. Let's just make up some stuff. Right? So, um, I was, uh, I grew up, I was homeschooled, never went to college and, you know, started getting into stuff like sales, inside sales at first and outside sales. Got into real estate when I always think when I turned 24 and started specializing in short sales. And it was difficult back then because the market was booming. So there weren't a lot of them. So I was doing short sales before anyone really knew what a short sale was. Yeah. So then um, when the market crashed um, in late 2006, early 2007, everyone, you know, you know, there were short sales like you could walk out your door and basically trip over a short sale. Yeah. So I started really figuring out and diving in on to how to getting them done. You know, signed up for high end coaching programs, bought courses and programs, attended seminars. You know, same type of same type of thing. There weren't any like free podcasts back then, like uh, or, or at least it wasn't as popular as it is now. So right. the people listening to this are, are lucky. <laughs> but um, and then kind of what I. Um, realized was that uh um you know short sales were a pain in the butt to get done so i figured out a way to get them done without actually doing any work without talking to a seller without talking to a buyer without talking to a bank without looking at a house so i systemized that and ended up closing 150 deals mm -hmm. and then people started asking me you know how are you doing this how are you closing this so i started partnering with investors and realtors locally and teaching it at like real meetings locally and then I met this guy, uh, a guy named Chris, by the name of Chris McLaughlin, who knew a thing or two about uh, internet marketing and real estate. He was a real estate broker, owned a Keller Williams office yeah, for over four hundred. Chris has agents. actually been on the show before. I've had him on here. All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Cool. And um, we started ShortSalesRiches.com back in late two thousand eight. And in 2009, we, uh, you know, just selling information so, um, with our core product being the Short Sales Riches system, we ended up doing five million dollars our first year you know, selling and teaching people how to really do it. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about marketing really at the time. It was just kind of luck. I was just really, I just kind of got in with the right people and it was like the right place, right time. Um, and to date, since then, I've sold $10 million worth of products on the internet, 10 or 10 million plus on the internet, um, selling different types of programs in different areas and niches of real estate and then areas and niches of real estate that I was an expert on I would partner with people that were an expert on and sell them those programs but what kind of really bothered me and what kind of led me to where I am to where I'm where what I'm working on now is the fact that 
you know, you end up in this, you know, you going from doing it to, to teaching it. And what ended up happening was you kind of look at, okay, well, we sold 100 of these programs and only one person did anything with it. Yeah. So, like, what is the difference between the one person that does something and the 99 that do nothing and they're on to the next shiny object? They're buying the next software. They're buying the next coaching program. They're buying the yeah. next course. They're listening to the next podcast. And I'm not saying that those things aren't good. They're pretty much a necessity. You have to do them. But the one missing thing that I found um, and having this, like, unfair bird's eye view of looking out how things are marketed and sold to people and versus and looking at people that actually do stuff was the fact that life is essentially a good old boys club and this applies to really any business it also applies in the, your per, the personal realm as well which we won't talk too much about but in the business realm real estate specifically life is essentially a good old boys club and there's what i call this good old boys club conspiracy okay and what i mean by that is is the people that you know buy the software they they get a hundred on the real estate exam if say they're trying to get their your real estate license or they sign up for the most expensive coaching program they're not the ones that do the most deals yeah. the people that do the most deals are the ones that successfully infiltrate the good old boys club in the niche that they're trying to conquer so the people that get in with the real estate agents private lenders hedge fund managers and wholesalers and partner with them um, and find the contractors and you know you know find people that can finance their business they're the ones that make all of the money so it is a good old boys club it's not fair and the sooner you realize this and shift your mind to infiltrating the good old boys club so you can start thinking strategically like okay what kind of deals do I want to do who are the ones that can make this happen okay how do we infiltrate this the sooner you're going to not just be closing one deal here or one deal there but the sooner you're going to be able to closing and have consistent closings with checks week after week yeah. and I kind of lost my passion for real estate and started and realized that I had the same success and the same reason was internet marketing so like in internet marketing it's not the people that know all the tech stuff. It's the people that get in with the other people and get them to endorse them, yeah. partner with other people, and get them to provide content for their courses, find the guy that's an expert at traffic, and get them to run all your traffic for you. They're the ones that make all the money. If you want to get a high-paying job, it's the same thing. The person that goes and gets a four-year BS degree at college probably is not going to get the highest-paying job. It's the person whose daddy plays golf with the owner of the company. He's the one that gets a job. You want to be an actor? The, the best actors are not the most successful actors. The best actor or the most successful actors are the ones that get in with the casting directors, the producers, and the directors. You know, Hollywood's one giant good old boys club. And if you look at anything that you're trying to do, becoming aware of this is very, very important. Yeah. How, how much of that is, uh, so you say, from what you're saying, how much of that is kind of who you know versus your mindset to go know more people, to go figure out how to find those people? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a percentage on it, but it's probably 50-50 no, realizing that and then going out and getting to know people. Yeah. Um, and now there are seven different things that I've, I kind of realized from looking back because I realized, okay, so an example is when we're selling the – when I was educating people on how to go and flip short sales, I would say, okay, go out and find real estate agents and tell them and, and give this elevator speech to get them on board with working on you. Nine out of 10 would come back and say, well, I tried that and it didn't work. Like I tried building a relationship with them and going over this little elevator pitch, but it didn't work. And I'm just thinking, and they were like, oh, it must be different in Florida where you're at. Right. The realtors must be different. They said what I was doing was illegal or they said this or said this. And I'm just thinking, what is wrong with these people? Yeah. And I realized that there were things that I was doing that I didn't realize I was doing that were influencing and making um, and, and putting myself in a different position of power to be able to infiltrate and influence people to get into their good old boys club. Yeah. So said, so, so said another way, there are these good old boy clubs that you know, you know somebody who knows somebody and they can get you in the door. Most people don't have that. You and I probably didn't have that. But what we had was a mindset of success to say, I can go figure that out and separate myself from the others. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So I kind of break it down because like I could just come here and say, you know, like I'm kind of 
shifting everything and what I do to make money these days is I do consulting for companies but the the next niche or you know book I'm writing a book that is going to teach this type of stuff is kind of like the personal development arena but in the, even in the personal development space it's like okay you know that you'll hear people say things like you're the average of the five people of you most hang out with or your network is your net worth or do people you know in order to get what you want you have to give everyone else what they want but what does that really mean that just sounds to me like a bunch of like motivational bs and people like take that with a grain of salt and they're like okay well yeah that's that's fantastic great okay i need to hang around cool people yeah. but what is it specific <laughs> Specifically, that really gets you into the good old boys club. And I realize that there are seven different things that you have to be aware of that are either keeping you in the good old boys club um, or going to push you out or prevent you from ever getting in. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll name off these seven things right now. Let's do we'll it, man. Talk, we'll talk so these about are, what are these called? The seven? I call this the gay knobs formula. Okay. So the title of my book and my formula is called Get Anything You Want, No BS. Okay. And, and the acronym is G-A-Y-W-N-O-B-S. Gay knobs, the W is silence. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> all right. All right. Um, and uh, the seven things are third-party endorsement, frame control, likability, your appearance, your credibility, your popularity, and your ability to tell good stories. And once I, you know, you break down, you really dive into all seven of these things, you can literally manufacture all of this stuff um, to infiltrate the good old boys club. So I'm not going to be like one of those personal development gurus there is going to say, oh, okay, you have to work on yourself. Okay. And you have to like go on this quest and, you know, go sit in a cave for 40 days and then come out enlightened and then you're going to be able to get whatever you want. No, 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 no. There's a good old boys club and there's a reason why you're not getting into this club part of the reason is probably because you're there's things that you're doing that come across as douchey um and we just have to to make you aware of that so you can get better at approving proving it the next time and yeah. slowly and slowly you're going to infiltrate this club so you can get whatever you want before um, we even dive into that there is another thing that you have to be aware of other than the good old boys club conspiracy okay you know because we know that's real you've accepted that's real you've accepted that you're probably not in it okay and that you need to get into it and you know there are some stuff that's keeping you out of it but before we even dive into that you have to be aware of another thing it's called the homer vendetta okay so if you ever you ever watch the simpsons oh yeah okay so like when i was in third grade um, I went to a private Christian school, and my third grade teacher, Mrs. Lyle, she said, don't watch The Simpsons because it's, you know, Bart Simpson is disrespectful to his parents, and he says, don't have a cow, man, and, you know, you know stay away, and we're like, oh, my gosh, we can't watch The Simpsons, you know. In third grade, I'm eight, you know, now I'm 33, so that's essentially how many years, like 25 years yeah. um, of the same cartoon running over and over and over again yeah and this is because as fat lazy dumb americans we really like um find similarities between us and homer okay and everything that is being marketed to you um marketing messages all the marketers are aware of this homer vendetta but they may not call it homer they may call it something else so let's just look at homer homer is fat he's lazy he's dumb he eats donuts he drinks beer and he goes to work and pushes a button at a power plant every day yeah. okay so if you look at everything that is marketed to you on how to make money get fit find that special someone or really anything is designed to market to that inner Homer in us to provide us either a magic button or a pill that we just take that will solve our problem. Yeah. So like when I'm coming up with a real estate offer, for example, this is okay. Now this, I don't even know if we should be talking about this because this is like behind the scenes, like pay no attention to the man behind the curtain type <laughs> stuff. So I don't know if we're, we're doing, you know, if I should, even, I don't know if you're even want me to give away this information, but I'm just going to go with it. Do we're it, just man. Do it Let's do it. All right. So the Homer in the real estate niche, if you want to come up with a good real estate offer to teach people how to make money in real estate, even though we know that the truth is the people that make money, they have relationships with people and they work hard and they have advertising budgets and they build networks and they understand how to analyze deals. So that's the person that actually makes money. The person that we sell to 
is a 40 to 60 year old Christian conservative, uh, may, 70% male, 30% female, probably leans more to the right politically. He wants to make, you know, he goes and he watches uh, like sh- sh- uh, TV shows, reality shows like Flip This House. He's working a job, probably making seventy-five to $150,000 a year. And he watches reality shows. He sees the guy and the team flip a house and they make a, they make a, um, you know, they make thirty thousand dollars on one deal. That gets him interested. He sees that late night infomercial and buys that twenty dollar book. That gets him interested. He might listen to this podcast. But the reality is, he wants to make money flipping houses in real estate without any of his own money, without any of his own credit, without building relationships with private lenders, um, without really doing any work. He wants to wake up out of bed, check his email inbox, and have seller and buyer leads in his email inbox and closings every single week with big fat checks. And he thinks that real estate gurus only make money teaching real estate and not actually doing real estate. So our goals as a marketer is to overcome all or most of these objections and present it to you into some type of magic button so that you'll buy it. Okay, That doesn't mean you're actually going to do anything, and that doesn't mean that there's anything unethical with it. But in this market, the, the ethics is certainly pushed in certain cases to where – all your marketing is is showing lifestyle pictures of how cool you know the real estate guru thinks he is and using all kinds of NLP and hypnosis and Jedi mind tricks to trick you into buying it yeah okay that's the reality okay so once you're aware of this Homer vendetta if you want to go down the rabbit hole and take the red pill and really infiltrate the good old boys club step one is to stop being Homer <laughs> okay you can't be Homer anymore. You have to stop buying into that lie because it's only going to take you so far. It may take you, you know, you may go and you may buy the button, you may buy the pill, and you may close one deal. But the only way you're going to be able to consistently close multiple deals is if you're stop being Homer. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, go ahead. Um, no, what were you going to say? So talk about the, the different, uh, the seven steps. So we, can we go over those a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if we're going to have time to cover all seven of them, but I'll give you like some good juicy stuff. So number one is third-party endorsement. Okay. So third-party endorsement is, is never talking about yourself. Hmm. And this goes, you know, this is in the Bible. Don't boast about yourself. Okay. This is, you know, just typical wisdom. Don't boast about yourself. Get other people's. To, in, to endorse you, okay. rather you endorsing yourself, um, endorse other people, and then master the, what I call the humble brag. Okay. Okay. So third-party endorsement is basically like if I walk up to you and I say, Mike, listen, you have to send me all your short sales because I am awesome and I have this great team behind me and you need to give me all of your short sale leads and you know we close all these deals. You know, It may work, it may not, but I may come across as a douchebag because I'm talking about all of my credentials. Yeah. However, let's say we, we have a mutual friend when they actually introduced me and the, the, the reason why I'm doing this interview in the, in the first place, Jason Lucchese, who was a previous guest on your show, yeah. um, if he were to say, Mike, you really have to use Nathan um, because he's awesome and he's the best and he closes all of these deals and his company does this, he could say the exact same thing as I would. Right. But because he's saying it, but it's not me. Right, right. Okay. It doesn't come across as douchey. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why you inter- you did agreed to interview me on this podcast. Same thing, because yeah. I got a third party endorsement, yeah, right? That's absolutely right. So you want to strategically always get third party endorsements. So in a pra- another practical example in real estate would be okay. We all know that we need private private money, mm-hmm. and we have all these different you know buttons that people can push to automatically get a private lender. You know, calling us like right. backing at our calling door. But let's think about it strategically. Okay, where do these guys hang out? I would I would say I would say. Uh, go to your f- investor-friendly title company that you're already doing deals with and build a relationship with that title agent. And if you're giving her or him business, um, ask him, you know, I know you, you're you doing, you did how many closings last month? Oh, we did 30 closings last month. And how many of those were private money? 15. Okay, well, there, were there any um, one individual private lenders that you saw that were consistent on the most of your deals? Yes, this such and such guy or this such and such guy's company. Okay, well, who's the contact at that company? Can you do me a favor? Can you send me an email introduction introducing me to that private lender? 
Okay, that is going to go a, a lot further than just going to networking events and asking people if they're a private lender because you right. know that they're really lending on private money. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so never talking about yourself, getting others to endorse you, figuring out who's the good old boy, who does he know, and how can I get him to either introduce me in person or just send a single e email intro. Yep. Mike, meet Jason. Jason, meet Mike. Right, right. And in the email intro, they would talk about why you're amazing. Yeah. Okay. Now, people, when they're getting started and they have no network, they ask me or they have problems. Well, I don't understand how am I going to get third-party endorsements because I don't really know anyone. And just like in the personal development world where everyone's talking about in order to get what you want, give everyone else what they want. What does that really mean? Here's what that actually means. It means give as many endorsements as possible when you're starting out. Go to the public foreclosure auction. Get some business cards. Find out what can, or get their business card. Find out what it is that that they're looking for. Go to the title agent. Find out what they're looking for. Meet some real estate agents. Find out what kind of deals they're looking for, and just start putting people in contact with other people, even when there's no financial gain for you whatsoever. Maybe there will be in some cases, like a wholesale deal would be the perfect example of where it would where it would be because that's essentially what wholesaling is. Right. It's third-party endorsement. But if I go and I introduce, um, you know, like in the internet marketing space, I give my web guy, the guy that, that built all my websites and all my video sales letters and webinar stuff, I give him referrals all the time. Um, now he feels like he owes me. So a lot of stuff, I'll get my, a lot of times I'll get my stuff done for free. Hmm. Okay. Yep. So when you're constantly giving third party endorsements, like weekly, um, you have more influence and you have more power and what you say, um, goes a lot further than what if you didn't do this. Right. The thing is, is I'll tell people to do this a hundred times and they'll never actually do it. Right. Okay. You have to actually do it. That's, that's like, that's the key. Yep. So, um, go ahead. Go ahead. The, and I was going to say the fourth, the fourth um, um, leg of third-party endorsement because there are going to be times where you have to talk to someone, you have to talk about yourself, and there's no one available to endorse you. You have to master the humble brag. Okay. So, um, an example would be at the beginning of this of this um, interview. You know, I kind of spouted off my credentials, but I didn't. I did it as as humble as I possibly could. Mm. So if we were to go to completely the other way and I was going to be an arrogant douchebag, okay, I would say something like, yep, I flipped 150 houses because I was the best at short sales in my market and people saw how awesome I was. So then I started teaching people how to do it and I sold $5 million my first year on the internet right. because I was such a marketing expert. And to date, I've sold over ten million dollars. Even though all that's true, it's not likable. Right. So I'm come, try, kind of coming off across as a douche. So I didn't do that. What I did was, uh, you want to say something? Well, yeah. So this is kind of what I fell into, and I started teaching people how to do this, and it ended up working out. And I met this one guy that knew a thing or two about internet marketing, and consequently, we did five million dollars our first year. And it wasn't because I was a marketing expert or anything like that. I really didn't know what I was doing. It was just kind of a right place, right time kind of a thing. And then I started slowly learning about marketing and we had a lot of things that we tried that failed. And, uh, you know, I think that's probably why I'm doing marketing consulting now and why a lot of my clients have had such a high success rate because knowing what not to do is more important or just as important as knowing what to do. And I think that's probably why I've had such success. Okay. Right. So see the, see the difference? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. It's the humble brag. So you, you never want to go there if there's someone else that can already endorse you. So like when you go to networking events, you want to go with what I call a networking buddy. So have you ever met – you guys have interviewed Matt Andrews, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's a good so like me, yeah, me and him will go to internet seminars in different places, and we're like networking buddies. I'll talk about him; he'll talk about me. Okay, and we'll kind of like meet in the middle, and that's a lot more effective networking than just going out and yeah. being. A and what's interesting for real estate investors is they they tend to be very good at chest dumping. <laughs> right, they, just, they tend to brag, which it may be true or not, but uh, it's one of those things where. 
I don't know it's, if it's because they don't social, a lot of real estate investors are kind of in their own bubble and don't socialize a lot. So when they get together, they're like, well, I need to stand out or I don't know what causes that, but that's a very common trait in real estate investors for sure. Right. Another, um, okay. So let's talk about frame control. Frame control is the second leg of the, the gain ops right. formula. Okay. Um, frame control is basically, um, a contest to see who doesn't give a crap the most. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's an adjustment that you make in your language patterns to be more persuasive and to have more power over certain situations. Okay. So like an example would be like the president of the United States, Barack Obama is the most powerful man in the world. He has the highest frame. Okay. And I, I'm not particularly an Obama fan. And I would guess that most of your listeners probably aren't either, but um, if Obama were to go, if I was in the Oval Office and Obama said, Nathan, go make me a sandwich, I would probably still go make him a sandwich because of his high frame. Okay. Yeah. So your goal in any social situation is to make it so that the opposite party would make you the sandwich and not the other way around. Okay. Okay. There are four different types of frames that you can use in your language patterns. And these, these four types are uh, setting the frame, smashing the power frame, giving the frame away, and accepting the frame. And you're going to use different ones depending on whatever social situation that you're in. Yeah. Okay, so setting the frame would be if I'm, um, let's say that I'm going to be holding a webinar um, or have some type of marketing video that is going to cover, you know, the the good old boys club conspiracy. Okay, one thing I might say in one line that I really like is this webinar training is only for people who truly believe that they deserve to be told the truth. So if you don't fit into that category, then this probably isn't for you. Okay. Yeah. So the you know, like movies use this in Hollywood. If you go and you watch a movie, the little green screen that comes up before the preview, it always says the following preview has been approved for all audiences. You'll notice that the word preview in all audiences is in bigger, bolder font than the rest of the sentence. So everyone watching is like, oh, crap, we're subconsciously you're thinking, okay, we're all audiences, so we better watch this. Right, right. And then like later on, the racier rated R films, the previews will say the following preview has been approved for appropriate audiences. You'll notice that no one gets up and says, oh my gosh, we're not appropriate, so we better get up and leave. No one gets up and leaves. Right. Okay. Everyone's like, you know what? I'm appropriate. I'm mature enough for this. Okay. Um, it doesn't say something like, uh, don't watch this if you're under 13. Okay. Right. Um, you know, so typically you always want to set frames that people want to live up to rather than tell someone not to do something. Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to tell a realtor, like a female, uh, let's say like, a, you know, like the female soccer mom types of realtors yep. that are a total pain in the ass that find ways to kill the deal because they think everything is illegal and they need eight, <laughs> bill, 8 billion disclosures and they're the buyer's agent on your deal. Right. Okay. If you tell her, could you stop being a pain in the ass so we can just close this deal? She's going to be a bigger pain in the ass. But if you say, what's your name? Oh, yeah, yeah. Someone was just telling me about you. I heard that you um, really knew your stuff. Well, I'm really looking forward to working with you because I can already tell that you really know your stuff. Now you're setting a frame to where she pretty much can't be a pen in the ass. <laughs> right. okay? if, you, you know, if you tell someone not to do something, they're typically going to want to do it even more. Right. Um, in the early 80s, um, the anti-drug commercials that came out that said, don't do drugs, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. They did a study that it actually, when those commercials came out, more kids had started smoking pot. Hmm. Okay? It had the opposite effect. Yep. Um, in the Bible, when Jesus healed a man, in the book of Mark, he healed a man's tongue. And then he told the, uh, everyone that witnessed it, he said, don't tell anyone about this. And they said that the more that he told them not to tell anyone, the more they spread <laughs> right. his gospel and his news. So I don't know if he was doing that on purpose or not. Um, you know, I'll let you decide. I'll let you be the judge of that. Yeah. So um, is that, that's kind of setting the frame. So you always want to use words like, I only work with smart people. I can tell that you know your stuff. Um, those are frames that you want to set up. You want to inspire people to be better. Right. Um, I'll use one more example. John F. Kennedy said, ask not what you can do for your country, but what your country, or what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. 
he didn't say just stopping stopping such a lazy asshole and just be glad that you live in this country right okay both of those lines both mean the same thing but one's going to cause rebellion and one is going to inspire you to be better sure okay absolutely smashing the power frame that is the second leg of frame control um um, smashing the power from is basically when you're going up and you're negotiating with people who are richer, better looking, more powerful, more successful than you are. So an example would be the example of when I got the title agent to send me an email introduction to the private lender, we agreed to meet for lunch. I've never done a deal before. The private lender has several million dollars in funding. Who has the power frame? Right, they do. The private lender, right. So does he show up at noon when we agreed to meet and agrees to listen to my whole entire presentation, my entire pitch? No. He shows up 20 minutes late. He says that he doesn't have – the clumsy power frame says he doesn't have time to have lunch, but he's got 15 minutes to have a quick drink. So show me what you got. The last thing you want to do is become very reactive and – um and like look like a deer in headlights and say something like, oh, okay, well, that's no problem. Let me show you the perspectives for the deal that I have that I need your body for, okay? That comes across as needy. Right, absolutely. Yeah. People don't trust needy people, okay? So um, what you want to do is you want to smash that power frame and maintain frame control. So you'd be very non-reactive and you would say, oh, that's totally cool. Um, it's not going to take me 15 minutes to explain to you this anyways. I only need 10 minutes of your time. Um, I can kind of show you on paper what a deal looks like that I run across on a weekly basis. I don't have anything now that I actually need your money for, but I do typically run across deals that look like this on a weekly basis. Um, so I can kind of show you what that box looks like, and you can kind of tell me if those are the deals that you need to invest money in. And if not, that's totally fine. Maybe you can kind of tell me what you're looking for and what you need, and maybe I can open up someone in my network that meets that criteria. Before we do, let's make sure we like each other first because I only do business with people I like. And from all the good things I've heard about you, I'm sure you're probably the same way. Let me go grab a cup of coffee. Miss, excuse me, I'm going to get a cappuccino. Do you want anything, Mike? Okay. I totally just smashed his power frame right. and took all the power frame away. And in a very nice way, yep. I said, I've got the deals and you don't. Right. And if you want access to them, you're going to have to be cool. You're cool, right? I'm cool. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to make sure. Um, there's an actually, there's a book that really goes in depth. The entire book is just on frame control that everyone in here should definitely pick up. Everyone listening to this should definitely pick up. It's called uh, Pitch Anything by Orrin Clough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, I knew this sounded familiar. I was like, this is something I read recently. That's what it is. Yeah. You should definitely interview that guy. You should probably try to line him yeah. up if you can. But that, that guy literally like will raise like $20 million for companies. And that's all he does. So if you're really into like raising money, like this is really like it's a really really good book on just that aspect. Yeah, yeah. Cool, man. Well, uh, why don't we go over one more? We're we're running out of time here, but uh, this is good stuff. Can we go over one more? Okay. Sure, sure. Cre um, credibility is the credibility and popularity. A lot of the stuff overlaps. It's the hardest thing to manufacture, but. The more credibility that you have, the higher your frame is, so the less language patterns in NLP and frame control you have to even use, okay? So an example of increasing your credibility would be like if you had a four-year college degree, you have more credibility, okay? If you have your real estate license, you have more credibility in certain situations. If you have a law degree, you have more credibility. But those are just credentials on paper. Yeah. Okay? So it's like that's just one leg of credibility, and there's seven different things. So literally the people that are going to college right now um, – and getting a four-year degree, the only thing they're focusing on is just the degree. They forget about everything else because they have like these college blinders on. So it's like makes it probably for I think one twenty-eighth of of all the variables that are going to get you into the good old boys club and ultimately get you the job or career that you want. Right. Okay. But there are a few other ways to manufacture credibility. So one way is something you're already doing is you start a podcast. So you start a real estate podcast, okay? Guys, just so you know, Mike makes no money by 
from the actual podcast, the actual podcast itself, from publishing a podcast and interviewing people like me and interviewing other investors, it doesn't like do anything for him. However, it gives him a lot of credibility to build a following. And if I were just going to do real estate locally, and if that's all I wanted to do, I didn't want to be some national guru, I would still start a podcast. And the first thing I would do would start to interview people locally. So find the guy that's the biggest REO agent and tell him that you want to interview him for your podcast and that's going to go on your blog. Now you're not calling up like every other douchebag and asking him to um, that you want you know first looks on all of his REOs before they hit the MLS. You're having a reason to call him. Okay, so you're saying, hey, I want to interview you. I see that you're obviously mover and shaker and you're doing REOs. I want to interview you and talk to you about the whole REO game. Now you're feeding on his ego, and this is the first entry door to infiltrating his good old boys club. Mm. And Mike, without even realizing it, you probably did. I don't know how much, to what degree. This is what, the 190th episode or how, how many episodes? Almost. I don't know what it is. It's, uh, I got to, yeah, 188. This should be episode 188. So that means before me, there's 187 other people that you've interviewed that you didn't have relationships with before, or maybe you did, but now they've been strengthened because you had a reason to call them and endorse them and let them talk about how awesome they are. Yeah, that's right. So who knows what that would lead to. That increases your credibility substantially. And then all the people that go to what you flipnerd.com, and they go and they opt in to get on your list, that increases your popularity, okay? Mm. So that gives you, makes your frame higher, and it makes it very easy <laughs> to infiltrate the good old boys club. So mm. an example is when I start actively, really aggressively finishing my book and building my following, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start a podcast, and I'm going to start interviewing authors that have a similar following that, that, would, that people – that want to buy my book would buy yeah. okay so and talk about you know whatever as a way to get my foot in the door with them so that when my book launches i have a relationship with them so now i can reach out and ask them to give me a third party endorsement on my book yeah the other thing is you always want to have what i call credibility tunnel vision so whatever you're working on now you want to ask yourself, is this going to give me credibility to work on whatever the next thing to do I'm going to be doing is? I'm not the same type of person that can do the same thing for 30 years. Right. Okay. Most entrepreneurs aren't. But I always knew that, okay, I'm going to work on flipping real estate, and this will give me credibility so that when I, when I want to teach people how to flip real estate, I can do that. And then when I start teaching people how to flip real estate, I can use that as credibility to become a marketing expert, to start giving marketing consulting to individuals that want to start a following or to companies that want to do, that want to increase their sales. And then when I do, when I do that, I can use that as credibility for different stories about how I infiltrated the corporate business consulting good old boys club and use that to write my book. And I can use – and once I write my book and I launch it and I use all these strategies to launch the book to make it a New York Times number one bestseller, I can use that as credibility to, um, to do higher and bigger consulting deals with more companies. Absolutely. And to sit on their board and meet four times a year and get paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for essentially just coming up with ideas. <laughs> right. Okay, you have always got to be thinking one, two, or three steps ahead as to what you're going to be your credibility for, because it's not just something you can really fake. You can kind of fake it, but the credibility and popular popularity aspect of of infiltrating the good old boys club is something that happens organically over time but if you're not aware of it you may be spinning your wheels working on something that's not you're not going to be able to monetize later on in life right right awesome so nathan to clarify all this stuff is going to be in your book that's coming out next week right uh you know <laughs> that's a, that's the thing it's like just writing a book and publishing it really isn't going to do anything right you have to spend a good year building the following yeah to launch the book so that you're getting your following to endorse it on their Facebook and getting other prominent thought leaders 
to, to launch it. Right now, my good old boys network is in the real estate space. I know just about everyone, but this book would be sold and people that want to do an MLM or people that want to be a real estate investor, or people that want to be an online marketer, people that want to get a high paying job, um, people that want to be some type of entrepreneur, people that want to raise money for a business, people that want to raise money and start a nonprofit or a ministry. Um, it's, a, it's a much broader market and there are different pockets um, and there's so many other networks that I don't have access to yet to be able to sell 50,000 copies in a week. Because right. that's what it's going to take to get to New York Times number one. So if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it half-assed. I want to do it right and use all the same strategies in the book to launch the book and document the entire thing online so people will actually be able to tell whether I'm full of it or not. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's like if anyone says, oh, well, the only reason you were a New York Times bestseller was because you knew this guy, this guy, and this guy, you get them all to endorse your book. And my answer is yes, exactly. That's kind of <laughs> the point. That's what we're teaching in the book. So the sooner you accept that and do the same thing as I'm doing, the sooner you'll be able to get whatever you want. That's right. So then once we break down all these seven things, then I show you how to come up with your evil master plan, as I call it. Yep. And uh, basically break down and figuring out, okay, well, what is it that I want? Who are the good old boys that, that can make this happen? And then break it down into phases of phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four to infiltrating that club. So ultimately I get what I want. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover all seven. But So go over them again because uh, you said it really fast. Sure. Third-party endorsements, number one. Third, Third-party endorsement. Frame control. Which basically not talking about yourself. Frame control is a difference in language patterns yep. that you can use to give yourself more power. Likeability. And that does not necessarily mean just getting everyone to like you. It's actually getting certain people not to like you so that the other people love you. It really should be <laughs> right. called lovability. Yeah. Um, your appearance, what you look like. And this, there's variables to this depending on what good old boys club you want to um, infiltrate. Credibility popularity and the ability to tell good stories and be a good storyteller mm, that's, awesome. that's another good one like everything that i've been really talking about i've been telling in stories so that your audience understands what i'm talking about yeah. the homer vendetta the good old boys club conspiracy um i've all used stories to get my point across and the better communicator that you are and the better the better you can get people to understand what it is you do the more effective and more influence that you'll have. Right, right. Awesome. Well, Nathan, thanks for thanks for your time today. Thanks for sharing some of these strategies. They're great. And why don't you share a, another minute just to kind of talk about the importance of this? Because you know, my community is mostly real estate investors. A lot of people that are listening right. here, how they the importance of applying these things is often the difference between success and and not success. I mean, very often. So just kind of maybe apply that. Give, give kind of a summary there. Yeah. The, the, Basically, and there's a real estate good old boys club, yeah. and it is absolutely real. And the difference between the people that close one deal and just through luck or hard work, as we call it, and closing several deals every week or every single month with very little effort is the people that have the networks, yeah. the people that are in that club. Absolutely. That's, like, that's it. Once you do that, and it's not going to happen right away. You know, you're going to spend a good six months to a year doing this. Sometimes you may get lucky and it may happen right away. But once you're in that club, then, um, you know, the sky's the limit. You close, you're the guy that closes a thousand deals a year, which I know you know a lot, a lot of people like that. Yeah. And you're the guy that gets to that next level, writing the book, coming out with a program that teaches people how you did that. Yeah. Um, you know, and you may not want to do that. That's fine. You may want to stay in real estate and that's okay. But, um, that's r really mastering what I'm talking about. Once you're aware of it, then you really you can go and do anything. Yep. You know, you don't have to do, just be in the real estate box, as I call it. You can absolutely do anything. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Nathan, if folks want to learn more about you and some of the stuff you're working on, where, where do they go? They go to leopardpill.com. Okay. Awesome, leopardpill.com. Awesome. That's my blog, and um, you know, as stuff progresses, I'll be updating that. Uh, so you can check it out. Okay, awesome. We'll we'll uh, add the link down below the video here. And thanks so thanks so much for joining us today, my friend. It's really good stuff, and I hope that people uh, stay tuned for your book. But just there's a lot of other books that talk about some of these same things, and really just kind of focus on becoming a, a master networker ultimately, right? Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for your time, my friend. All right, thanks. All right, we'll see you.
Are you a member of Flipner.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence? Where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market. You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit Flipner.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to Flipner.com.